Welcome to ZDNet's DIY IT Projects Lab, where I'm testing 3D printers for your entertainment and edification. Today, we'll be looking at the Creality Sermoon D1, an enclosed direct drive FDM printer from the makers of the super popular CR10 and Ender 3. My name is David Gewertz, and you're watching ZDNet's 3D Printing Discovery Series, which is part of my DIY IT column. In addition to testing 3D printers, we also explore maker and smart home technology, stress test servers, fly drones, and regularly dive deep into advanced geekery for fun and profit. Before we get started on today's review, I'd like to remind you that this video is part of a comprehensive 3D printing and desktop fabrication discovery series. If you'd like to know when the next review is up, feel free to click the subscribe button and the little notify bell in the corner over there somewhere. Today we're assembling and testing the Creality Sermoon D1. This is a very nice printer, but there are a few issues in setup and design you should be aware of before you scoop one of these up. Let's start with assembling this thing. At 26 pounds, this is a hefty machine. Its build area is 280 by 260 by 310 millimeters. In some way, this is a more industrial quality printer than the units we're used to seeing from Creality. The four supports are solid metal, providing for a very steady printing process. It also has an all metal direct drive extruder, again, contributing to the more industrial quality nature of the machine. And as I mentioned earlier, it's enclosed on four sides, the top is open. This allows you to maintain better heat integrity inside the print area. One gotcha about this design, and it applies to the $6,000 Ultimaker S5 as much as this $699 machine, is that the bottom layers are printed with the build platform near the top, so heat isn't managed for early layers. But as the model gets bigger, the bed lowers into the closed chamber. Since heat is maintained inside the machine, there are fewer temperature fluctuations, making for more robust prints. One nice feature is the filament runout sensor. In a few minutes, I'll show you that runout sensor in action. It's great for big builds where you might run out of filament. For a pretty industrial quality printer, I was a bit bummed to find out that it doesn't support automatic bed leveling. That said, it's relatively easy to dial in a level bed using the big knobs Creality includes under the Carborundum glass build plate. And with that, let's put it together. I opened up the directions. Little did I know that these were going to be the bane of my existence for the next three hours, as a number of things were instructed to be assembled in the wrong order. I was happy to see that all the screws and bolts were marked so that I knew which was which. First, it was time to assemble the four vertical posts that hold the printer together. And now we come to the main build challenge, where the instructions got the order backwards. The instructions tell you to put these center towers up and then mount the build tray to them, and then somehow lift up the build tray while attaching both the towers to the base and the vertical screws into the towers, all while somehow balancing the build tray. This turned out to be a bad idea. I wound up removing the bed assembly and then putting the lead screws in first and then remounting the bed assembly on top, which worked out really well. I then just rotated the lead screws to lower the bed assembly. By contrast, mounting the top was simple. It was just a matter of putting it in place and screwing it down. Hooking up the electronics was pretty straightforward. The cables were labeled well and fit together nicely, so that was just a very simple matter of plugging the plugs in where they belong. Like the much more expensive Ultimaker printers I've previously reviewed, this printer is enclosed on five of the six sides, so now it was time to put the sides on. Another big gotcha of this build is how they recommend you put on the back panel. They suggest you put on the back panel after you put on the first side panel and that's incorrect. 
Instead, put both side panels on first, do all the fiddling you'll need to do with the wiring and connecting up the spool holder, and then put on the back panel. I wound up taking the back panel off again, doing what I needed to do, and then putting it back on. I found that taping the panels in place made it much easier to avoid dropping them on the floor. And yes, I did. Now it's time to put the back panel on yet again. And now for you fans of ASMR, I present you with a full minute of peeling, tingling, glorious sounds as the protective film is removed from the plexiglass. The front hinged plexiglass doors went on with no problem at all. And because we can't get enough of this sound, here we go. go. The last assembly step was putting on the end caps and then we're all done. Almost. The printer seemed to work. I could raise and lower the print bed. I could heat up the extruder. I just couldn't get the custom interface Creality provides on its touchscreen to read my SD card. In fact, I couldn't get it to read any SD card. After a few back and forth emails to Creality tech support, I wound up opening up the bottom of the printer and reattaching a cable that must have come off or come loose in production or in shipping. Once I fastened the cable securely in place, I plastered it liberally with hot glue and made sure it won't move. And then we were done. It was time to do some printing. Let's start with the gorgeous Statue of Liberty print just to show you what this printer is capable of. As you can see, it's an amazing print. There was some gooping up towards the top of Lady Liberty when the Sir Moon was trying to print the tiny bits, but overall this is one gorgeous print. Here are my print settings for the statue print. I'll show you some more prints in a few minutes, but first I want to go over some of the other slight eccentricities that are part of the Sir Moon D1 experience. First, Creality ships the printer with its own Creality slicer. As it turns out, it's just a reskinning of Cura with the appropriate printer settings for this machine. Weirdly, Creality only ships a Windows version of Creality slicer, even though Cura has a Windows, Mac, and Linux version. Fear not, though. If you're a Mac or a Linux user, just pause this video because here are all the settings I use, which I just typed into my copy of Cura on the Mac.
The G code is listed below as well, so all you need to do is cut and paste it into your profile. Let's take a moment and look at the Yoda print. I print Yoda heads as a test print for all my FDM printers. They make great test pieces because the ears and shin show how well the printer handles overhangs. Spare Yoda head prints also make great giveaways to 3D printing curious visitors to the Fab Lab. Another oddity is the control interface. Unlike the CR10 and so many other 3D printers, the Sermoon D1 doesn't use Marlin. Instead, it uses its own slightly proprietary interface. On one hand, the interface is very easy to use, especially if you're instructing an operator how to run prints. All someone needs to do is select an item to print and hit print. But here's where it gets weird. You can only have 20 models on any given SD card. No folders, nothing. We set up a model that we print a lot and it has more than 20 components. Even though the models used less than 1% of the card's capacity, I had to switch to a second card for the remaining eight components in our project. It's far from a deal breaker, but it's a really odd design decision. Another odd design decision is the placement of the USB-C port, which is inside the enclosed chamber. I have no quarrel with the decision to support USB-C instead of USB 3.0 for use with thumb drives. What I do find inconvenient, however, is that the port is inside the closed chamber, which makes connecting a Raspberry Pi and controlling the device via Octoprint inconvenient at best. Either a cable has to be routed down through the top of the opening, possibly tangling with the XY axis workings, or a hole would need to be drilled in the plexiglass side. It's far from a deal breaker, but it's just a bit annoying. I would have much preferred the USB port to be on the outside of the machine, maybe down here, perhaps on the edge of the lower compartment where the logic board I had to fix is located. Let's take a quick look at the Dragon. I'm not gonna show you this in too much detail because I had a heck of a time trying to get the white filament to show up on camera. Here's a power tip. If you're going to film 3D prints, print in gray, not white. In any case, you can see how well the filament change mechanism works. Prompting from the user interface is a bit dodgy, but when the filament runout sensor triggered, I was able to swap in a new filament roll and keep printing. There is just one gotcha about the filament runout sensor. If the filament breaks between the runout sensor and the extruder, your printer isn't going to stop. Ask me how I know. Finally, let's take a look at the Benchy. Overall, it prints well with just a few blobs. You can see from this bottom shot that the first layer prints with good definition. Bridging, as seen over the front window, holds its definition nicely. You can see very nice texture on the deck from this top view. And as we pull back focus, you can see how well-defined the smokestack and the roof are. So let's wrap this up. The Sermoon D1 uses a direct drive rather than a Bowden extruder like on most of the other Creality machines. I haven't tested flexible filaments, but a direct drive has a much better chance of extruding flexible materials reliably. The Carborundum glass build plate held up reliably. I've used glue stick for extra adhesion and that's worked well. On the positive side, it's very, very quiet. It's probably the quietest of the FDM 3D printers I've tested. A big part of that is because it's very, very solid. That also probably leads to its reliability, which we've seen across many prints. On the negative side, setup is annoying and steps are out of order. That could cause failures among those less experienced with building projects. Plus, it had a failure that required opening up the internals of the machine to fix. The odd limit on the number of files usable on the SD card isn't a deal killer, but it's annoying. And while we're on annoyances, the inability to clearly run or cleanly run a USB cable to the USB port makes it hard to upgrade to Octoprint. All that said, the bottom line is this. If you can put up with the quirks and the assembly hassle, it seems to be a solid and reliable printer. I've been printing with this pretty constantly over the last month or so, and I have turned out about 50 items. My wife is using it to print a few models over and over for one of her projects, and the menu, while limited, makes print selection easy. Once it was tuned, fiddled, and cajoled, it just works. For ZDNet's DIYIT, I'm David Gowertz. Go out there and make something awesome!